This week, we just want to say one thing. Black lives matter. Yes. Uh, not, not all lives matter. Black lives matter. For when people say black lives matter, no one is denying that all lives have value or that we should treat everyone with equal respect or dignity. No, when people say black lives matter, they're pointing out that systematically, black lives seem to matter less than other lives. In health. In policing. In jobs. And so much more. So, black lives matter. Black lives matter. Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Addison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy in Auckland and Hamilton, respectively. It is Josh Addison and Dr. M. Dentith. Indeed it is. It, uh, it's getting into winter here down in the Southern Hemisphere. So it was one degree when mm. I got up yesterday morning. I don't know whether it was that cold up in Auckland, but here in Kirikiriloa, one degree. I spent 38 minutes in bed willing myself to get out. Mm. Apparently there's this big super high that those dastardly Australians are sending our way, and it's going to be negative 15 degrees somewhere. Not Auckland, I assume, but... It's usually the South Island that mm, gets that I would cold. assume, yes, yeah. yes. So, but at any rate, keep that whiskey handy. You might need it. Or possibly just a large St. Bernard with a little little barrel of whiskey on its collar. Right, yeah, a large St. Bernard filled with whiskey. Mm, mm. But we're not here to talk about the weather, although we could. And indeed, we just have. Well, yes, yes. Uh, no, so it's... It's kind of funny how it worked out. Um, this week we're going to be talking about COINTELPRO. Because... And we are probably going to be debating how to pronounce that throughout the entire course of the ep mm. episode. Is it coin COINTELPRO? 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 Oh, probably or not that last one. COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO. Mm. Mm. Um now, this is something I can't even remember why. A few weeks ago it came up and it was one of those, oh, hey, we've mentioned that. We've never actually done a full episode devoted to it. Um, so it seemed like a good thing to do. But then in light of the recent week's events, I think it takes on quite a more um, appropriate tone, uh, especially when we look into the major targets of the COINTEL Pro gram. Um, so I don't think we do. We, we don't have anything to say off the top, do we? Should we dive straight in? I think so. Let's get into surveillance by the state. Hmm. Actually, another thing, because of course, Cointel Pro is short for Counter Intelligence Program. Of course, it is. So, so should it be Cointel Pro if it's if, if if it's getting its first syllable from Counter? I mean, we've had this discussion in the past on the mm, podcast mm. about the way in which people try to come up with wacky-sounding abbreviations, yes. abbreviations for programs based upon basically manipulating words or initialization. Mm. And in that respect, yes, you probably want to respect the words it's meant to refer to. So, yeah, I showed up, I mean, counter. I guess it was cow... Intel, Intel Pro. Pro. Cal Intel Pro. There we go. We now have a de facto pronunciation of the program. It is the Cal Intel Pro. I mean, what program? What? Except actually, programs in the name anyway. Mm. So it's just Cal Intel Pro. Cal Intel Pro. You heard it here. Why not? What was wrong with CIP? Why not just call it the CIP? Why? Why? Why do you? I, I don't know. Anyway. We're not yet, of, of all the things the FBI has done in relation to COINTELPRO, or however you want to call it, the coming up with of that abbreviation is probably at the lower end of, uh, of, of offensiveness. Um, yes, I think, I, th I think that is correct. Mm. Uh, COINTELPRO is, of course, um, a series of counterintelligence projects conducted by the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover, ran from 1956 to 1971, and only stopped in 1971 because they got found out, as we will see. Um, and it was a program, yes, it was the FBI, so it was internal to America, um, aimed at uh, surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting 
um, and disrupting political organisations in America, in particular, not exclusively, but almost exclusively left-leaning um, Now, Josh, are you aware that there, that there was a sequel? No, I do, it does not surprise me in the slightest. But I... Because there was Operation Chaos, which was a very similar programme run by the CIA after Cal Intel Pro, which we should probably do in another episode. Mm. Because as we will see with this story, technically... Cal Intel Pro ended with its revelation. Although Technically. People, yeah, people are suspicious of that official story for good reason, as we'll get into when we talk about the sorry end of the Cal mm. Intel Pro program. I wish I'd stop saying pro program. It just mm. sounds ridiculous. Yes, yeah, so um, Hoover was in charge um, of the FBI at this time, but uh, William C. Sullivan was the agent in charge of the program, who was directly under Hoover. Um, RFK, good old RFK, who we've devoted an episode to, was Attorney General for at least some of it, and, and he personally authorised some of the things that they got up to. Um, so it started in 56, targeting the commies. I mean, we all know about Hoover and his reds under the bed and his his um, general paranoia of communism, but I think I think it's fair to say Hoover had enough paranoia to go around, wouldn't you say? Yes, Hoover was the kind of person who'd be suspicious of people being suspicious of Hoover, mm. and that turned out to be almost anyone who was even to the moderate left of Hoover. And Hoover being quite right, quite right. there's a yes. lot of space there. Although it does, it is interesting when we carve out the conceptual space of who was actually surveilled assassinated and the like by the Cal Intel Pro program. I'm just, I'm just going to commit to it now. It does turn out you had to actually be quite to the left of, left of Hoover to really get into his bad book. So even though he was paranoid, he was particularly paranoid about people on the left. And as we're seeing with President Trump in the US at the moment, with the notion of this amorphous enemy, Antifa, it turns out the left may have started with the explicit communists who you were concerned were actually being controlled by Mother Russia and ended up being anyone who identified with the left at all, which meant things like the civil rights movement mm. and Martin Luther King. Yes, so apparently the, the very first targets of COINTELPRO, I'm going to go COINTELPRO just, just, just to mix it up, just for a bit of variety for the listeners there. You have betrayed me, Joshua, for the last time. Yep. Uh, so the first targets are apparently the Communist Party and the Socialist Workers Party. But yes, very, very quickly, um, its its range was broadened. And in particular, the civil rights movement came under the microscope. And in 1963, which was the March, for Was uh, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the civil rights movement march, uh, which is when Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous his famous speech, the, the, the I Have a Dream speech. Um, at that point, apparently, Hoover then singled out King himself as um, a major target for COINTELPRO. Um, so this went, you know, at 56 to 71, that's what, 25, 15 years? 15 it, years, it yes, I can do basic mathematics. Yeah. Um, covered numerous presidencies, everyone from FDR all the way up to Nixon signed off on various um, surveillance methods that came under COINTELPRO. Um, but yes, eventually. Now we have a. I have a list I've got off of Wikipedia, um, which I'm, uh, which you might as well just go through a, the, a list of groups that were known to be targets of COINTELPRO operations. So we have communist and socialist organisations, organisations and individuals associated with the civil rights movement, which we'll get into uh, a bit later. Uh, black nationalist groups the Young Lords, the American Indian Movement, the National States Rights Party, a broad range of organizations labeled, quote, New Left, including Students for a Democratic Society and the Weathermen, almost all groups protesting the Vietnam War, as well as individual student demonstrators with no group affiliation, the National Lawyers Guild. Is that a, is that a Jewish thing? I don't even know why, why you'd be paranoid of lawyers. Or, sorry, when I say a Jewish thing, is that an anti-Semitic thing? Yes, I do wonder whether this is one of these situations where maybe they were concerned that anyone who unionises is going to be on the left. So it's fine to be a lawyer, mm. but definitely don't belong to a guild. I mean, there's certainly a civil rights suspicious. Lawyers. Yeah. 
But yes, it goes on, organizations and individuals associated with the women's rights movement. Nationalist groups such as those seeking independence for Puerto Rico, United Ireland, and Cuban exile movements, including Orlando Bosch's Cuban Power into the Cuban Nationalist Movement, um, and also some white supremacist groups, including the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, although only, mm. only because... Lyndon Johnson actually insisted you need to survey all these guys as well. This was not a group that Hoover wanted to survey. This was a group that the president went, no, uh, actually, you kind of do need to check on these people too. They go around burning people, hanging people, and burning down buildings. We should probably keep an eye on them as well. Mm. Um, and yes, so as well as these organizations, they were keeping tabs on specific individuals, including obviously the likes of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Fred Hampton, member of the um, Chicago Black Panthers, uh, who was notoriously murdered, uh, Huey P. Newton, co-founder of the Black Panthers, murdered in 1989, so long after COINTELPRO had officially ended, but nevertheless. Allegedly. Uh, Muhammad Ali, I mean, obviously, Nation of Islam, and also very vocally against uh, the Vietnam War, Ernest Hemingway. Well, I mean, after all those books he wrote with those interminable beginnings, I'm not surprised they had mm. uh, Jessica Mitford. Of, of the Mitford sisters. I, I don't know a lot about the Mitford sisters. Other than there, there are about half a dozen of them, and they managed to all do interesting things right across the political spectrum. I know one of them was buddies with Hitler, but it wasn't Jessica. Jessica was the other end. She was the lefty one. Um, it was a writer Sorry, and journalist, I, I believe. I like the idea that the, the Mitford sisters are a kind of spectrum going from extreme right on one side of the photo to extreme left on as, the other. As far as I can tell, they pretty much yeah. were. But... So this idea of a photo of the Mitford sisters, hmm. we've got one Mitford sister, you know, arms around Adolf Hitler. And hmm. then on the other extreme end, you've got arms around Martin Luther King. Hmm. I mean, yeah, that it, 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 photo may exist. I don't even know. And readers, if you have a copy, please do send it in. We would love to see it. Hmm. So I think maybe we'll come back to um, uh, civil rights figures in a moment, but but perhaps it'd be good to just talk about when, when we, we talk about these opera uh, operations, counterintelligence is a fairly nebulous term. So what exactly did people get up to under the umbrella of COINTELPRO? Well, it wasn't just about the spying and the wiretapping. So they did do your basic standard surveillance to a very large extent. No, Calvin Tor Pro was about infiltrating and undermining organizations. So the idea was they simply weren't keeping tabs on organizations they had designated as being problematic, unpatriotic, or against the American way of life. No, they wanted to expose, disrupt, misdirect, and otherwise neutralize the groups that FBI officials believe were subversive. And they did this in a variety of rather interesting and also disturbing ways. So one thing they were particularly good at was creating a, a negative public image for the groups they were targeting by basically surveilling the groups and then releasing negative personal information to the public about those groups or portraying those groups as being bad and public enemy number one. And possibly their most successful tactic of this particular kind was the way they treated the Black Panthers because for a very long period of time, if you mention the Black Panthers, they were treated as a criminal gang of some description, in the same way that when you talk about the mongrel mob in this country, we think about them as being a gang associated with criminality and drug use and distribution, as opposed to the other things they do. Because people tend to forget the Panthers were a civil rights organization that basically existed to provide a framework and infrastructure for African Americans at a time where there was no easy access to social welfare. And as I said that, I went, actually, there is no easy access to social welfare in America at this particular point in time. But actually, it turned out it was a lot worse back in the 60s, particularly if you were not a white person in the U.S., so the Panthers existed as an organization to provide that kind of infrastructure and to ensure that people had access to the things they actually needed. Now, this kind of 
ground level activism which was basically promoting racial equality and trying to counter systemic oppression and racism was the kind of thing the FBI thought was leftist propaganda and the kind of thing that only scums got up to. So they basically ran a PR campaign to make the Panthers look like they were criminals and only criminals in order to ensure that people would oppose they're coming into neighborhoods, black or white, and also using that to try and discourage people from learning more about the Panthers and what they were actually doing. So basically, Cointel Pro was part of making sure that people thought the wrong things about the right kind of people. Now, of course, they did other things, apart from engaging in PR campaigns, they would actually bring people into organizations in order to create conflict in those organizations by basically getting people to, say, exacerbate racial tensions or sending anonymous letters that seem to be in the know to try to create conflict. Yeah, in they liked their anonymous letters, from what I'm reading. A lot oh, of anonymous letters. Yeah. yeah, including anonymous death threats, which doesn't seem like mm. the kind of thing that an intelligence agency should be sending towards members of the public, but we'll get on to that soon enough. They would, of course, spread rumours to make sure that groups were antagonistic towards each other by, say, spreading the idea that one group was taking money or creaming money off the top of a particular movement or taking money that didn't belong to them on the idea that this would then make it harder for groups to work together. They would pressure non-profit organizations to cut off funding or material supports to organizations that the FBI didn't consider to be right or proper. They would engage in restricting the ability to organize protest. Now, Joshua, that seems that seems a bit topical. Sounds a little familiar, yes, yes. Uh, marshalling government-controlled forces to um, restrict people's right to assemble and, and protest. Um, so yes, like I, like I said at the start, so uh, reading through this sort of stuff, it's like, hang on, this, the, the, this, like we didn't, it's kind of coincidence that we came to this now, but, um, it's definitely appropriate. Now, of course they do other things. They would basically engage in character assassination and possibly actual assassination false arrests. So they would make it look as if people had been arrested to cause dissension or dismay in an organization. They, of course, engage in just your standard, typical surveillance. But also, and to my mind, this is one of the most disturbing things they did, they also finance armed and largely controlled a right-wing militia group. So they basically took former members of the Minutemen and transformed them into a group called the Secret Army Organization, that then went round terrorizing groups, activists, and leaders involved in the anti-war movement back in the 1960s. Mm. And, I mean, so this was um, FBI agents. From what I gather, they would also sort of draft local police um, to, to get, on some, get in on some of this stuff as well. And we can sort of see how, um, certainly in the case of the civil rights movement, all of these things were in play. Interesting, one stat I read was that supposedly there were known to be 295 COINTEL operations launched against black nationalist groups. Of those, 233 targeted the Black Panthers specifically. Um, yes, Fred Hampton uh, was killed in 1969 when the building he was in was raided, but uh, the details of the raid sound an awful lot more like an assassination, uh, from what I can gather. He was he was in bed. Um, officers uh, who had been tipped off of the building's layout by someone within his group uh, essentially opened fire, I think, from outside of his room, but pointing at what they, the position that they knew to be his bed inside the room, fired something like 90 rounds or something. And then according to eyewitness reports, uh, when it was found he was still alive, uh, someone went in and shot him twice in the head. Um, so that was, that was uh, right in the midst of COINTELPRO. Also in the middle of it, the murder of Malcolm X, uh, murdered in 1965 by someone 
uh, supposedly by someone with ties to the Nation of Islam. Now, Malcolm X had belonged to the Nation of Islam, but it had something of a falling out with them. And there was always talk amongst people of how much of that falling out had been orchestrated by the FBI, because as we just said, you know, that was one of the things they did foment discord, uh, try to create divisions both within and between various groups. So even, so, you know, and there are a variety of conspiracies around this along the sort of, uh, me hop lee hop lines you know you don't have to believe that it was actual fbi assassin who shot him you could believe that the fbi basically set things up so that there were people who were willing to shoot him on their own steam and then of course we come to dr martha uh, martin martha goodness me dr martin luther king jr murdered in 1968 and again we could probably devote a whole episode uh, to him, but um, and in fact, maybe we should. Maybe we should, but in brief, I mean, Hoover. Hoover was apparently, you know, Hoover, Hoover was paranoid and, and obsessive, but he was apparently particularly obsessed with with Dr. King, um, in particular because I believe King had been fairly critical of the FBI as well, and Hoover wasn't taking that. Um, so there was all sorts of stuff. They apparently um, he wanted. Now it was. Um, I think it was. I think it was RFK. He was. He, he was. Did set on surveilling Dr. King, and RFK said, "Okay, fine. I'll let you do it, but only because I think this will prove that he's not a communist." And apparently, yes, this, the, the the surveillance and the wiretapping and what have you showed that no, he wasn't a he wasn't a commie, so they couldn't get him for that. Um, but they had apparently um, followed and, and surveilled him enough to find out the various um, extramarital affairs he had had. Uh, and then the story, which I've heard numerous times, that supposedly then one of their famous anonymous letters found their way on Dr. King's doorstep, where they basically said, hey, we know about all your affairs, um, and essentially hinted that maybe he should think about suicide, perhaps, as an alternative what, to yeah, all of this coming yeah, to light? Yeah, one of the ways to make sure these affairs don't come to light is just cease existing, Dr. King, and everything will be fine. Mm. So after he was um, assassinated, shot uh, with a, I don't know if it was technically a sniper rifle, but shot from far away with someone with a rifle, which sounds sniperish to me, um, James Earl Ray was convicted of his murder, but um, conspiracy theories have always abounded there. Um, and in 1999, uh, King's family brought a civil case against a man called Lee Jowers, who claimed himself to have been paid by the Mafia to help organize an assassination. Uh, so the case was against Lee Jowers and other unknown co-conspirators. Although I would like to point out for people listening at home, Josh has managed to write that out as co-conspiractors. Uh, conspiractors. That's a really, really nice term. It's even better, yeah. We need more yeah. conspiractors, I think. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's as good as the fact that every time I try to write conspiracy, and I write it a lot in my academic work, I can't help but write conspiracy. Mm, yes, exactly. Um, so my, my typos aside, so, in, in that, in, so this was a civil case, not a criminal case, and apparently King's family asked that if, if judgment was found their way, they wanted, to, wanted it to be a fine of $100 purely as a symbolic amount. Uh, but the jury, who apparently was consisted entirely of white men, nevertheless took an hour to conclude that a conspiracy was behind King's death and um, that James O'Reilly had been set up to take the blame. So while the FBI, you know, wasn't, I, I, I don't think it was officially found that the FBI specifically orchestrated uh, his death, there's, there's a lot of fishiness about, uh, around, um, around it, and we certainly know that COINTELPRO was... Um, very, very, very strongly involved in messing with his life. Yes, which is why there are a number of conspiracy theories about who actually killed Martin Luther King and also whether the person who was convicted of his death was in fact framed. Mm. Now, as we said, this went 1956 to 1971. Um, and it stopped in 1971. Is, is, is that because they uh, finally had an attack of conscience and realized this was a silly thing to be doing and just decided to pack it all in on their own steam? Well, yes, but they had an attack of conscience because they were found out as opposed to decided that actually this was a wrongdoing and maybe they should have never started it in the first place. But this is where things get really interesting. So... Activists are concerned about what the FBI is up to because activists are particularly aware 
that people on the left seem to be targeted by the FBI in a way that people on the right are not. And this leads to certain leftist activists, including the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI, getting interested in what the FBI are up to. Now, this particular part of the story I'm not sure about. I've seen this reported several times online, but I actually can't find a citation to show it's actually true. Apparently, the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI realized that because the FBI were heavily invested in surveilling Muhammad Ali, the fight of the century which occurred in 1971 between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier was the perfect time to make an attack on the FBI because the FBI would be so focused on what Ali was doing, they would be looking in the wrong direction. So the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI instigate a burglary of an FBI field office in Pennsylvania and they take 1,000 classified documents and then hand them over to the media. Mm. Now, initially, the media does not want to report. No, they do not. They are very resistant to even looking at the documents. But as these things tend to pan out, a few journalists are willing to write some initial stories about the trove, which then means that other journalists feel they need to report upon it as well. And what was initially a trickle turns into an avalanche in one of my famous mixed metaphors. Mm. Um, yes, this was. Uh, there's a movie called 1971, which came out uh, five or six years ago, um, which apparently uh, which dramatizes these events. I haven't seen it myself. Um, I have not either. No. The, uh, so they, they just basically grabbed whatever they could from the sounds of things, and so a lot of it was was fairly benign, just you know stuff the FBI looks into because they're the FBI, various crimes and so on that happened. I have I have heard the claim that one document out of this entire trove was found to use the term COINTELPRO, which is how they sort of got onto it, although I read about that in a description of the plot of the movie 1971. So that that's possible that's artistic license, I'm not sure. Um, but but I mean, whatever often the... Often people don't refer to Operation mm. in actual documents because they know it's just going to be under the aegis of that document classification system anyway. I mean, this actually does get you down to the problem that some conspiracy theorists have about the Holocaust. But they, well, you know, but there's so few documents that refer to the final solution. Okay, so, well, yeah, I mean, but that's to be expected. I mean, when you're engaging in a mass extermination campaign that you know that everyone else knows about and is engaging as well, you don't need to state it in your document. You just need to state numbers and times mm. because people know what that refers to. It's, a, it's just a standard operating procedure that when you're writing this kind of documentation or writing reports, you know who's going to read it so you don't repeat information that they, they don't need to know. Or well, that they already know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's my, I mean, the example I use when I'm teaching is the the classic thing you got to see in mummy films. Now, Josh and I, we've we've watched a fair number of mummy films in our time, for better or worse, and almost all of them will feature two Egypto Egyptologists about to break into a tomb, and one of them will say, "Well, of course, I ha I know you know the history of this place, but let me explain to you exactly who's." buried here mm. in a way that professional archaeologists never engage in because you don't end up going, now I know Joshua, you know, an awful loss about this particular tomb, but there's a camera over there, so I really need to explain this for the audience watching at home. Mm. Yes, no, it's more like um, the Neil Stevenson book Cryptonomicon, which has one of the most Neil Stevenson exchanges I've ever seen where two characters are talking about how they're going to name their company Epiphyte Corp. And one of the characters says to the other, you know what an Epiphyte is, don't you? And the other character says, yes, I do. And uh, the book carries on like that, the subtext being, oh, oh, you don't know what an Epiphyte is, reader. Gosh, how embarrassing for you. Because as I like to say, the moral of every single Neil Stevenson book is that Neil Stevenson is more intelligent and well-read than you, the reader. Uh, which is one of the many reasons why I don't read books. Anyway, um, 
So this, uh, yeah, it sort of started off slowly and kind of snowballed from the sounds of things. From what I gather, some kind of smaller, smaller media outlets were the first ones to publish this sort of stuff, and then as it as it gained steam. Uh, people started looking into it more, and the bigger the bigger the network started taking um, taking note of it. Um, so it, it could no longer be ignored. And so yes, within the year, Hoover had said, "Right, well, okay, you Co- CoIntel Pro is no more." Um, it didn't mean they're not going to be doing counterintelligence ops. Uh, just that there will no longer be this broad umbrella project that where, where, where anything goes. They'd be do- looking at them more on a case by case basis. So it's not like anything actually. Stopped happening. They were just supposedly committing to be a little bit less slapdash about it. Yes, yeah, so they're going to be less systematic and more selective. Although, as people point out, that's a great way to make the problem disappear. Because a, by saying you're more selective, then you don't have a program that needs to be referred to. It makes it a lot easier to do things effectively off the box. And arguably, we've got a lot of evidence even to this day that security services around the world are kind of curiously fixated on particular groups and not other groups. I mean, this was one of the big issues we had here Mm. after the mosque shootings in March of last year was the realisation that it turns out our security services, like those in the UK and the US, seems to be of the opinion that left-wing groups are dangerous and right-wing groups are not. Mm. Yes, yes, which led, well, we all know where that led. Um, so the FBI did get raked over the coals for the, to, this um, to some degree. Uh, so in 1975, the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities of the United States Senate was formed. This is most commonly referred to as the Church Committee. Apparently it was was chaired by uh, Senator Frank Church. Um, So it started in 1975 and it looked at at dodgy dealings that the FBI, the NSA and the CIA had been getting up to, uh, some of it prompted by Seymour Hersh's reporting into some of the dodgy things the CIA had been getting up to um, abroad. Which is the Operation Chaos stuff. Mm -hmm. But within America, uh, COINTELPRO was, was what really got the FBI in trouble and so they um, they, they raked them over the coals. They were the, the, their, their summary was was highly critical of the FBI. Went into lengths about how illegal every uh, how illegal a lot of the stuff they had been was, how it had violated the constitutional rights of many of the people that the, the operations had been focused on. Talked about how the fact that. Um, the many of the agents involved knew that what they were doing was illegal and chose to do it anyway under the grounds of national security and you know had to be done to protect um to protect the nation and yet also one of the things that they criticized it about most strongly was was how broad um its 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 scope was um how it, was, it ended up just you know be, being an umbrella term for just any anything kind of lefty agitatory it, it, it supposedly was aimed at you know uh, violent groups groups that were a threat to security you know to to the lives of other Americans and so on but ended up looking at completely non-violent um, groups just because they came under the same umbrella so and um, that's because the FBI's stated motiv- motivation was that they were protecting national security preventing violence, and I think this is the crucial part, maintaining the existing social and political order. Mm. They can kind of go protecting national security. Yes, that's what a security agency is meant to do. Preventing violence seems like something you ought to do, as long as that doesn't stop systemic oppression from occurring. But when you're maintaining the existing social and political order, that's very ideological because maintaining the existing social and political order is basically maintaining the situation which allows you to be in power or to have the kind of security apparatus that surrounds you. Mm -hmm. And many of the leftist groups, as we're seeing with the Black Lives Matter protests, are going, no, we should be defunding organizations like this, which makes organizations like this go, Oh, oh no, no! You need no, to. I don't want to do that because that doesn't maintain the political, social mm. order 
that has rewarded us by putting us into the position of power we have at this particular point in time. Mm. And of course, that is essentially a political position from what on paper, at least, should be an apolitical organisation. This is and this is something that just comes up all the time, forever, always. Um, you get, you know, pe- people agitating for change, and then people say, why do you have to bring your politics into this? Um, choosing to conveniently no- ignore the idea, the fact that the idea we should keep everything just as it is, is a political position. That That's basically what conservative means. Um so yeah, it, it's 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 not really what you want um, in, a, in a in a I mean, we all know that uh, law enforcement um, organisations the world over do tend to have a bit of a political bent, but they're not supposed to be open about it at least. Although actually, maybe if they were open about it, it would make it a lot easier to them disagree with what they're doing and argue against it. I mean, so part of, part of the problem has been by hiding the political nature of these organizations and treating them as being purely neutral. They've got away with pursuing ideological ends for a long time. If people are actually honest about the, no, 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 we're here to make sure that nothing changes and we realize that that rewards only a select few, then it becomes a lot easier to then go, yeah, and that's kind of why we don't like you, because it's actually not very just what you're doing and the kind of society w- that you are defending isn't the kind of society that many of us can actually afford to live in. Mm. Um, now, speaking of small groups of people, um, after after all this came out and after the FBI had been soundly spanked on the bottom by the church committee... Um, various members of the FBI started coming out and saying, oh, yes, this is terrible. This is against the the character of the FBI. It's not what I signed up for and so on. Um, So uh, Oliver Ravel, who was at one point the FBI Associate Deputy Director, said that most FBI agents didn't know about COINTELPRO. And uh, once once these revelations came out, they disagreed strongly with it. His words were... Probably less than 200 people in the FBI ever knew of or were involved in COINTELPRO, and the other 8,000 agents were, like I was, investigating organized crime and all types of bank robberies and violent crimes, and it just seemed to be so out of character with the FBI that I had joined, and that I believed was essential to protect the rights of American citizens. Now, maybe that's true that uh, only a few select uh, people knew about this, maybe it isn't, for one thing, it kind of doesn't matter because the small group of people who knew about it were the ones at the top. This 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 started with Hoover and worked its way down. Um, but it is an interesting, I guess, illustration of the sort of things we've talked about in the past, how you can have a big conspiracy, but not everyone needs to be in on it. See, say, the, uh, the Volkswagen stuff. Yeah, so it only requires a few people at the top to know the full extent of what they're doing. And then you can have dupes and patsies who are just telling to do routine procedures or routine activities who are actually enacting the conspiracy who may not be aware exactly what they're up to. Although that being said, it is kind of weird to think that these other 7,800 people who were being asked to predominantly surveil people in the left community and engage in discovering dirt about them weren't weirded out by what they were being asked to do. So it seems a little bit weird for an associate deputy director to go, oh, no, no, only 200 people, not including me, ever knew what was going on. Surely people in the organization were working that out, which I think once again speaks to where the FBI was drawing its agents from at the time, were the kind of people who were not particularly perplexed or annoyed by who they were surveilling and also by extension who they weren't looking at. Mm. And certainly, as we said before, they would draft local police in to do various dodgy things like like raiding buildings and shooting people 90 times or pulling people in on trumped up charges or, you know, um, false arrests and all that sort of stuff. So, again, in those cases, you probably had 
uh, members of the police force who who were entirely happy to be sticking it to these various um, organisations. So, yeah, it's 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 feasible. It's 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 plausible that you had a small number of people at the top just sort of drafting in um, people within and without the FBI who then you would have been sympathetic to it. But still, it does seem to be uh, a, a a big enough thing that it's 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 hard to credit the vast majority of people throwing their hands in the air and saying, goodness gracious me, is this what the organization I work for was up to all this time? Does seem to does seem to stretch credibility just a little. And if you'll let me get political for just a moment, Joshua, because of course Please they don't get political at all during the course no, of no, the podcast. Not. One of the things which is interesting about Cointel Pro and indeed the security apparatus we find worldwide is the fact that, as mentioned previously, a lot of people were surveilled because they were left wing rather than right wing, which has led to questions. So, you know, why is it that the left gets surveilled and the right doesn't? And one answer, and this is only a partial answer, is that historically, despite the fact that the extreme right have been very problematic with, you know, killing people, engaging in lynch mobs and the like, the one thing they did have was respect for the state and for the apparatus of the state. So one reason why the right were not surveilled and the left were is that the left were calling for organizations like the FBI and the CIA to be defunded, whilst the right were broadly in support of extending those powers to make them more authoritarian. You'd end up ignoring the problems on the right because, you know, they might engage in a bit of murder, a bit of burning down of, of churches where African Americans go. I mean, maybe they engage in the old lynch mob, but you know, they'll be there defending us when things get bad. Well, you can't trust those people of color. They're the ones who think we're out to get them. Mm. How paranoid are they? Indeed. Yes. No. Did you see the guy, the, um, the, the the guy in the states uh, on the police where people noticed the very large SS tattoo on his yeah, arm, yeah. which they tried to say, oh no, that's just it was memorized. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a guy whose initials were SS or something that we wanted to commemorate, and and yes, we know it looks a bit like a, an SS logo, and by a bit I mean exactly like it. It's the same. How many fonts are there in the world? And 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 you're trying to tell us that you decided to get an SES written on your arm and happened to pick the exact uh, symbol used by the actual SES. I don't know. It's all look to quote the Simpsons. It is not die Bart die. It's, it's the, the Bart the Bart, Bart the and indeed Bart is German for beard. So anyway, oh, oh now okay. I think we've I think I think we've now got into the um, rambling about pop culture section of this podcast. Have you seen the clip from Dinosaurs that's been going around? The old, the old oh, dinosaurs. But I mean, I do remember di dinosaurs quite a bit. I mean, the, mo the most recent clip of that I saw was the end of the final episode, mm. which might be the bleakest yes. thing ever committed to celluloid. Look, if you're not our age, you might not remember that there was. Now, who was behind it? It was. It was. Big. It was. It was the was Jim. It, it was a Jim Henson. It was Henson. Yeah, it was a Jim Henson one. Yeah. There was a, a, a live action puppet show, um, which is a weird sentence, but it actually is completely bit, true. Um, about di about this family of dinosaurs, and there was a fair bit of sort of it was bad, I should say, at the start. It was not it was not a funny sitcom, and yet it ran for four years. It went a long time, and it had a lot of sort of social satire in it, and that a lot of sort of you had these dinosaurs with had a civilization that were just like people. You know, it was it was a family sitcom, only they all happened to be rubber puppets rather than human actors with a really annoying baby, with a really annoying baby, and um and there, be, there was a lot of sort of episodes along the lines of Gosh, look how stupid these idiot dinosaurs dinosaurs are doing all these things which actually people do in the real world as well and yes as you say the final of the entire show ended i guess appropriately with the dinosaurs going extinct um in, in, and this was in the what 90s early 90s yeah. something like yeah. that. uh in, in a, a, a due to climate change um they messed up the messed up the world's climate and they all froze to death which was yes an interesting choice for ending a, a, a beloved family sitcom but no the point is just to say, just today, people have been sending around a clip. There was an episode apparently where <clears throat> I don't know the details, but they had this cop show called Triceracops, which obviously is a, is a clever name. Um, 
And then for, for some reason, I don't know why, the dad got involved in it, and then they ended up retooling it. And so someone put up, there was a clip of the of the first sort of Triceracops show, which is these two sort of hard-boiled cops um, confronting a criminal and shooting him a dozen times, and that was kind of it. And then they show the retooled version, which is two cops confronting a thief and and putting their guns away and saying, ah, oh, you're just a misunderstood member of society who's been driven to this by poor socioeconomic conditions. And the guys and the, the, the criminals are like, no, well, but, but I'm actually, I'm a thief. I stole a car. But isn't all property theft? And pulls out a blackboard and starts to detailing Marxist theory to this guy yeah. in the middle of this sitcom about dinosaur puppets. It was um, quite interesting to see. Yeah, I do actually wonder whether... Dinosaurs is better than we gave it credit for. I think maybe it's cleverer in the, than we gave it credit for, but it was not good. I, I don't see any way in which it could be called a good show, but maybe a clever show. Maybe too clever for its own good. Yes, maybe it was both before and after its time. Mm. Anyway. Um, We're rambling us. about pop culture yep. now, which means the episode has effectively come to an end. But, but. for our patrons... There's more coming up, I would say after the break, but actually... I mean, there is a break, break. for us, technically, yeah. but you guys might listen to I don't know. I'm because not your mum, you can sit out if you want. We will be talking about the end of the Olaf Palmer investigation. Mm. It's finally It's over. Happened. 34 years and it's done. We'll also be talking about what Trump's been tweeting about, which is never good news. A claim that COVID-19 was made in a lab, which feels like so it's... So it should be another a, claim. Yeah. A repeat of a previous one, but this is this is new, Actually apparently. New and then we've got some local spy-related news mm. about spying, both by the internal spy agency, over people in this country, and external spy agencies trying to infiltrate the country. Mm. It's all very es exciting. Espionage, both foreign and domestic. Just the um, way I like it. Yep. So uh, if you're a patron, stick around. Or thank you for being a patron, for starters. Uh, stick around and you can you can listen to that one. If you're not a patron but you'd like to be, you could go to patreon.com and look for the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. Um, and I think, I think, uh, we, never, we never do the, hey, if you're listening to this on whatever thing, you should like and subscribe and give us a good rating because apparently it makes us – Better to, I can't remember, there's, there, there's a whole spiel you always hear about rate us on iTunes because it makes us easier to find or something. But anyway, if you're in a position to rate us, do it and do it highly or, or not, I suppose. You yes, but I mean, there's, I mean, there's no, I mean, if you want to give your honest opinion about the podcast, I mean, that's fine. But it's actually not very useful to us if you give your honest opinion. We'd rather you gave your dishonest opinion and give us five stars and mm. say we're the best podcast ever made, much better than, say, Chapo Trap House, maybe even better than The Dollop. I maybe. mean, frankly, it is it is conceivable that we could be. One day. One day. Actually, you know, so I, I actually think we peaked a long time ago. It's probably true. And our best days are well behind us, and we're just we're just trundling along now in the podcast as in life. Yes, mm. yes, this is true. Sad yeah. but true. So um, I'm depressed, uh, which means I think it's time for us to call this episode to an end, uh, which we will do in our traditional fashion by me saying goodbye and my saying murder she wrote. Mm. Makes sense in context. Been listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy starring josh addison and dr m r x Dentit, which is written researched recorded and produced by josh and m you can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its podbean or patreon campaigns and if you need to get in contact with either josh or m you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their twitter accounts monkey fluids and conspiracism
And remember, remember, oh December, what a night.